Good morning, and welcome to the Ohio Virtual Tax Academy. My name is Leah Briscoe, and I will be your MC for today's event. <clears throat> On behalf of the Department of Taxation, I would like to thank you for joining us today. We're excited to be able to use technology to reach out to our small business owners, our CPAs, our attorneys, and our tax practitioners. Before we hear words of welcome from our tax commissioner, there are a few housekeeping items I would like to cover. The first is in regard to CPE and CLE hours. CPE and CLE hours will be tracked two ways. They will be tracked by the amount of time that you are logged into the webinar, and also by your ability to properly identify the code words that will be given throughout the program. There will be a total of six code words given. Those code words will appear on the screen and also be verbally spoken by your presenter. You'll know when the presenter is getting ready to provide you with the code word as they will say something like, and now we'll pause to recognize the code word example. The code word will remain on the screen for about five seconds. Understand, this is just an example of a code word and not one of the code words that you will have to identify. You will want to write down your code words because at the end of the program, you'll have to identify these words in chronological order using multiple choice. The second housekeeping item is in regards to the reporting of CPE and CLE hours. CPAs, you'll receive an electronic certificate of completion that will have all of the reporting information by Wednesday, August 29th. Attorneys, we will be uploading your CLE credits on your behalf, and they will be available for you to view at the Supreme Court's website also by Wednesday, August 29th. So again, CPAs and attorneys, by Wednesday, August 29th, will have the certificate sent out and the CLEs uploaded to the Supreme Court's website. The last housekeeping item is dealing with questions and answers. Based on the number of people that we have in attendance and also the structure of our agenda, please understand that we may not be able to answer all of your questions today. However, please submit those questions through the chat feature and we will use the OVTA software, the GoToWebinar software, to record these questions and answers and we will have those uploaded on the OVTA page at tax.ohio.gov in the FAQ section also by Wednesday, August 28th. Now I'm going to turn it over to the Tax Commissioner, Joe Testa, for his words of welcome. Hi, welcome to the Ohio Virtual Tax Academy. My name is Joe Testa. I'm the Tax Commissioner for Ohio. We've been doing these OVTAs for quite a while now. Why do we do this? We want to bring the latest information to the tax practitioner community, to the accountants, the attorneys, the business people who need to know what's going on regarding tax in the state of Ohio. Any changes in the law, new court cases that, that might affect you. And we do this so that you can do it from the from the comfort of your own business uh, and, and not have to travel to, to Columbus to get these uh, continuing education credits. This has been really effective. We've had 10,213 attendees in these OVTAs who have earned 25,785 free continuing education credits um, as lawyers or CPAs. It's been pretty, pretty successful, pretty effective. So what are we going to do today? Today we're going to talk about uh, sales tax for construction. It's a fairly complicated area and it's, and it's going to require a lot of, a lot of thought to those people who work in those industries or involved in providing tax advice in those industries. Sales tax and construction industry is, is complicated, so you want to pay attention to that. We're going to talk about CAT tax, commercial activity tax. Give you some updates. There's been some recent court decisions that will affect commercial activity tax that you'll want to know about. Uh, we're also going to talk about business tax refund process, something that would be of interest and important to all the business people out there. So those are the subject matters for today. We're going to be uh, uh, having our presentations coming up soon. I want to thank all of everybody who's involved in this, our presenters themselves, of course. Our subject matter experts are going to be manning the phones, watching the computer screens, answering the questions that come in during the OVTA. I want to thank organizational development uh, for putting all of this together. They organize all of this and schedule the speakers and review all the materials and all of that. So they do a great job. 
job with all that. Also want to thank the Ohio Chamber of Commerce for helping us to disseminate this information about the OVTAs to the business community throughout the state. And then finally, most importantly, I want to thank you because this is what makes us successful is your participation. I hope that you get some good information today, ask good questions, and uh, we're going to continue doing this because we think it's a great service to all of you business people and tax practitioners throughout the house. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you for that welcome, Commissioner. At this time, we're going to get started with our first presentation, CAT Legal Update. Good morning. I'm Bob Koenig, an attorney with the Office of Chief Counsel of the Ohio Department of Taxation. I'm here with Ben Waterman, who is Division Counsel of the Commercial Activity Tax with the Department of Taxation. Our topic the first hour of the presentation is commercial activity tax legal update. And commercial activity tax, we'll be calling it CAT throughout the uh, presentation. And it's we're going to give an overview of some recent uh, notable legal issues from recent CAT cases. And then uh, just a brief uh, overview of the audit and appeals processes. But we have many final determinations to discuss Board of Tax Appeals and Ohio Supreme Court decisions. And we've even have a U.S. Supreme Court decision to discuss. So I'll turn it over to Ben. Thanks, Bob. As Bob mentioned, my name is Ben Waterman. I'm Division Counsel for the Commercial Activity Tax. Um, and in, over the last couple of years, we've had some interesting decisions come out. We've had some interesting issues raised by taxpayers. So we just wanted to give some updates on, on um, some cases that have come out that may be helpful for compliance issues or um, otherwise. Um, so some of the things we're going to talk about, some of the topics covered in these decisions are um, citusing of tangible personal property, citusing services, the agency exclusion, which is... Uh, popular popular topic, um, cases involving the net operating loss credit, and then some nexus cases. And then if we have time, we're going to do a brief overview of the audit process and appeal process with the department. I don't know if we're going to get to those slides because we have a lot of um, legal issues to discuss. If we don't get to those slides, please feel free to review them and enter questions into the webinar chat function and we'll try to answer them as soon as we can. So we're going to start off talking about citusing tangible personal property. Um, this is uh, often an issue that comes up particularly in audits. Um, so there are some important concepts that we want to go over and important cases that have been decided but we're going to give a brief overview right now. Um, up on your screen is the uh, tangible Personal Property Citusing Statute, it's 5751033E. That statute consists of four sentences and we've kind of broken them out here um, and I'll go over them briefly just to, just to describe how the department kind of views uh, the meaning of these four sentences. The first one we think provides the general rule and that requires that gross receipts from tangible personal property is citus to Ohio if the, if the property is received in Ohio. That's the general rule. Second sentence sort of expands on that and said, when the gross receipts from the sale of tangible personal property involves um, transportation, then it's where that property is ultimately received by the purchaser after all transportation has come to an end. The third sentence describes what transportation may include. Um, and essentially states that it doesn't matter whether the seller provides the transportation, arranges the transportation, whether the buyer provides for the transportation or arranges the transportation, um, or a third party is responsible for it. Um, we're going to look at where the purchaser receives the property in any of those cases, um, including customer pickups. And then the final sentence uh, talks about a specific type of delivery where the purchaser directs the delivery to a third party, to their designee. Um, and that follows the general rule that even though the purchaser isn't receiving the property itself, 
we're going to cite us those receipts to where the designee of the purchaser receives the property. Okay, thanks, Ben. Well, the first decision we want to talk about, there were two final determinations written. This didn't involve a board or a court decision, but it, it was Lexmark uh, Corporation. And Lexmark manufactures printers and printer cartridges. And this matter involved Lexmark selling printers and printer cartridges to Dell Inc., the big computer company. They, they used a warehouse that was owned by Siva Logistics, it's a third party shipping and logistics company. And when, when Dell purchased printers or printer cartridges from Lexmark, the sale, they both had space in the same warehouse in Ohio. And the, the cartridges and printers were moved from Lexmark's side of the warehouse to Dell's side then Dell took, they took title to those goods once they were moved to Dell's side of the warehouse. Then after that, Dell would sell the, the printers and cartridges throughout the world, and a motor carrier picked them up for shipment. And on to the, on to the next slide. We're still talking about the Lexmark final determinations. The issue was when was commercial activity tax due on the sale? Was it, was it based on when Lexmark sold the ink cartridges to Dell and then SIVA moved the cartridges to Dell's side of the warehouse? Or was it when Dell later sold the cartridges and printers which it had purchased to throughout the world and only a small percentage of of the sales went into Ohio. So the audited issue involved Lexmark's sale. So what we have here, we have we had a, two sales. First, Lexmark sold the products to Dell, and that sale occurred in the warehouse within Ohio. And then there was a there was a later sale when Dell sold the the cartridges and printers to its customers throughout the world, and a piece of which went to Ohio. And so our, our ruling, the determination on this and the final determination was the first sale from, Dell, from Lexmark to Dell was completed in SIVA Logistics's warehouse, and therefore, which the warehouse was within Ohio, the sale was completed within Ohio, so, the, so for that sale, the sale by Lexmark, and those taxable gross receipts for Lexmark are 100% CITES to Ohio. Thanks, Bob. Um, and that was a really interesting case with a lot of um, unique facts, having uh, the seller and the purchaser sharing a, a third-party warehouse. Uh, we don't see that too often, but, but this case I'm about to talk about is, is a very common occurrence. Um, this is Greenscape's Home and Garden Products, the Testa. Um, this was a BTA case, and uh, it is currently on appeal at the Court of Appeals in the 10th District. Um, but the BTA case has been decided, and um, the general fact pattern is that the taxpayer manufactured products that it sold to big box retailers. Um, in almost every instance, the manufacturer or the taxpayer um, did not arrange for transportation and did not actually deliver the products itself. So the big box retailers were arranging for their own transportation or they were picking the products up in their own trucks and in some cases bringing those products back to warehouses or distribution centers in Ohio. On uh, audit, we picked up those deliveries as being CITES to Ohio um, and the taxpayer argued that for for their purposes the sale was complete at their dock and that all of those sales should be CITES to Georgia where they were located. Um, now we just went over the statute so we you know I, I spelled out that the statute requires that it's where the 
purchaser ultimately receives the property after all transportation is complete, and that includes customer pickups. Um, that notion seems to have come from an old franchise tax case uh, where the opposite occurred, where a, a Ohio company manufactured tangible personal property and its customers came into Ohio and transported the property outside of Ohio. And the Supreme Court in that case decided that that sale should be cited outside of Ohio because the customer transported it out out of Ohio and that should not be included in their franchise tax base. Um, so customer pickup was considered by the Ohio Supreme Court as part of the, the term other transportation. Um, we're going to switch gears here a little bit and we're going to move on to financial services. Um, obviously that's a service so we're going to look to our statute for citusing services. Um, and the general rule for that is that the physical location where the purchaser receives or uses the benefit of what was purchased shall be paramount in determining the proportion of the benefit in this state. Um, for financial services specifically, we also have a reference to the franchise tax code. And part of that requires that anywhere the term net gains arises in the statute, we replace that with gross receipts. So if you're citing financial services for cap purposes, you need to use the gross receipt, not the net gain, as the amount that you're reporting. Um, so a question has come up several times now about how CAT should um, tax fees from financial services, investment advisory fees, um, transaction fees completed by uh, investors or financial advisors, um, and who the actual purchaser of the service is. Um, this is the two. All right. Um, going on with our our subject of citing of financial services, the Department of Taxation issued a final determination recently involving a large mutual fund company based in one of the western states in the United States. And the mutual fund company had, you have the mutual fund company and then they also had an investment management company which the mutual fund company was paying fees to the, uh, to the investment management company for the investment management company to be picking stocks and bonds for the, uh, for the mutual funds. So the, uh, the taxpayer, the mutual fund company and the investment fund company, the investment management company, they were claiming that taxable gross receipts that the, uh, that it should be citus to the western states since both of those companies are located in that western state. And as Ben was saying from the previous slide, the Department of Taxation looked at 5751033H and I, H being the part that requires net gains to be read to include gross receipts, and then 5751.033I provides that gross receipts must be apportioned to where they were ultimately received. And the department's analysis was that the ultimate beneficiary of the services rendered by the management company and the mutual fund company are the, the shareholders of the funds, many of whom are based in Ohio. So the decision was that the receipts are citusable based upon the location of the shareholders and Ohio was was going to apportion those uh, taxable gross receipts to Ohio in, in, uh, in proportion to its amount of shareholders. And going on to the next slide we're, we're still in thing, but now we're, we're talking about services and rents. And this, this was another interesting final determination written by the Department of Taxation this year. And it involves a national freight railroad that 
that didn't own any track in Ohio. There's there's four U.S. national railroads that are U.S. based, and there's a there's two Canadian. So there's six there's six major railroads that operate throughout the United States through multi-state regions. So this this railroad didn't have any track in Ohio, but they often had cars, rail cars, and locomotives in Ohio because the uh, the railroads worked together. And they, like, when a when a a, a train with all its rail cars leaves one uh, freight lines service territory and goes onto the track of another, they don't switch. They don't unload everything and put it in different rail cars and have different different locomotives carrying it. What they do is the, uh, the railroad that's using the other railroads, freight cars and locomotives, they pay car hire fees to the, uh, the owner of the, of the rail cars and, and power hour fees to the owners of the locomotives. And uh, the railroad here was arguing that since it was not based in Ohio, and that since it it had no employees based in Ohio, that it should not pay, it did not owe any cat tax in Ohio. And the final determination again drew upon the uh, the uh, statute 5751.01i, which says that gross receipts from the sales of services shall be cited to the state of Ohio in proportion to the purchaser's benefit in this state. And the physical location where the purchaser ultimately uses or receives the benefit of what was purchased is, is paramount in determining the proportion of the benefit to be cited to this state. And here, what Ohio did was we cited part of the car hire fees for the rental of the rail cars and the power hour fees for the rental of the locomotives was cited to Ohio based upon railroad track mileage. So I'll turn it back over to Ben. Thanks, Bob. Um, another interesting issue that came up in this case was regarding Nexus. So one of the problems this taxpayer had was um, they didn't necessarily know to what extent their property was being used in Ohio. They couldn't um, really allocate the actual uh, fees they earn from time that their cars or locomotives spent in Ohio versus anywhere else. And so as Bob mentioned, we used an apportionment factor based on Ohio track miles and everywhere track miles, excluding the taxpayer's own track, um, to get some sort of ratio that may be indicative of um, assuming that these cars and locomotives are spread evenly across the tracks that, that would hopefully approximate their presence in Ohio. Um, so the issue of Nexus was raised in this case, um, and there were a couple different angles um, that we approached it. First, uh, these railroads use a clearinghouse, a third party clearinghouse, to track and allocate these fees among the railroads. So in some months, one railroad may use another railroad's cars and locomotives more um, and actually owe the other railroad money. And in some months, they may be due money. So this clearinghouse was actually responsible for tracking all of those things among the railroads. And they would net out all of those amounts and just notify the railroad that had to pay or was due an amount. Um, so this taxpayer's argument included a reference that they, they didn't know where the cars were located. They recognized that they were in fact probably in Ohio and being used in Ohio and that some of those fees were generated from their use in Ohio, but they had no way because of this clearinghouse system to determine um, with any specificity what that amount was. Um, they also wanted to use the net number rather than the uh, gross fees, which obviously for a gross receipt tax, we frowned upon that concept. Um, but ultimately, we determined um, that they did have nexus. 
They did have a physical presence. They had more than $50,000 worth of their own property in the state during a taxable year. And they also generated fees in excess of $500,000 annually. Um, so we did determine that there was nexus in this case. Um, I, I included a quote on this slide. It actually comes from a different FD. The FD that this quote is from is TransUnion LLC, but it kind of helps illustrate the department's thinking in this regard that, that nowhere sales can ever rise. So if a business has a gross receipt, our statutes should be able to cite us it somewhere. Um, so I really like that quote from that FD and I just wanted to include it here because essentially this taxpayer was saying because we don't know where the appropriate CITUS is, the department can't CITUS it at all. Um, and, and we found that notion to be um, incorrect and applied our own apportionment method uh, lacking any better information. So we're going to pause right now to recognize our code word. The code word is CITUS. Write that down. Again, the code word is CITUS. We're going to switch gears here and we're going to move to another issue. Um, this is uh, CITUSing services related to healthcare. Um, the case we have is HealthNet Federal Services LLC. That's been appealed to the BTA, so currently we have our FD, but no decision has been made. Um, general statement of the facts is that the taxpayer administers uh, mostly government-sponsored health service programs. Um, so they manage health care insurance programs for government program enrollees. In many cases, it's Medicare, Medicaid, or TRICARE, which is the government health insurance for um, military veterans. Um, the argument here by the taxpayer was that all their receipts that they receive from the federal government are premiums or, or act like premiums um, and that there is a federal preemption that applies to taxing premiums paid by the federal government. Um, our position was that it was not a premium necessarily, it was more of a, they sort of figured out a rough number per enrollee, um, charged the government that amount, but if that amount was too low, the government would reimburse them the difference. So there was a lot less risk involved in this, so it wasn't quite a premium because they kind of had a guaranteed takeaway in these situations. Um, the other issue was that the federal preemption only applied to premiums taxes, and there was a specific exemption from the preemption for generally applicable taxes on net revenue or income of a business, and we determined that the CAT was more like a net revenue or income tax because it's a privilege tax, and it's based on gross receipts and not premiums. So we felt that the federal preemption did not apply in this case. Right, next, we're still on the topic of cytosing, and you've probably already determined that cytosing is one of the, the most common issues in commercial activity tax. And this, this uh, slide deals with the cytosing of electricity sales to Ohio, and some of the key provisions are we work with 5751.033C which is part of the CAT uh, section of the code. And that section provides that electricity sales and electricity transmission and distribution services are cited to the state as provided in section 5733.059. And that, that's a 5733 code section, which is Ohio's old corporate franchise tax, which was phased out I think the last year for corporate franchise tax, it was 2009 or 2010, but some of the, the statutes are still in use for other taxes, such as this 5733059D here, which CAT uses to cite us electric sales. And the first two 
bullets there under 5733.059D, those are those deal with cytosine when electricity is consumed in the state. And the second two bullets, the third and third fourth points, deal with cytosine of the transmission of electricity. And the third, the third point is that the sale of electricity, if to the seller or to a seller's related member, directly or indirectly delivers the electricity to a location within Ohio or to the border of Ohio, the border between Ohio and another state, that that electricity shall be cited to Ohio. And the fourth, the fourth type is when the sale of electricity is, is either by the seller or the seller's member directly or indirectly directs the delivery of electricity to a location within Ohio or to the border of Ohio, then that electricity is also cited to Ohio. That's my slide. Thanks, Bob. Um, so I threw up the, the general citusing statute here again. Um, and the reason for that is we have these Citus specific citusing statutes from the franchise tax, um, which had its own purpose. It was its own law, and those citusing statutes are a little bit older. Um, but when we look at those statutes, we need to keep them in the frame of reference of CAT. So the general citusing statute for CAT, intangible personal property, sort of informs how we look at those franchise tax provisions. And, and I'll just repeat again that um, the key thing that we look at is where the property is received by the purchaser. Um, that's usually what we're trying to go for. Um, another side note, there is another provision for electricity sales in the CAT statute. It's located at 5751.011. That's the Consolidated Elected Taxpayer Statute. And it essentially provides that sales from a, basically an electric generator to a regional transmission organization and then back to one of the generators related members for purposes of the consolidated election will be treated as inter-member sales. Um, but I want to caution people that's not a general exclusion for, for those sales. So if you only generate electricity and sell it to an RTO, your, all of your sales are not excluded. It would only be the amount of that electricity that a related member that you or a related member purchases back from the RTO. We'll ignore that transaction as being included in the inner member exclusion for consolidated elected taxpayer groups. Um, now, I'll let Bob continue now. Okay, we're, we're still talking about the side of electricity sales here. And this slide. Um, I did a whole slide on this because I was so fascinated with the regulatory agencies that, that deal with electricity sales throughout the United States. And the first type of entity are what are referred to as ISOs, which stands for Independent System Operator. And these are entities that are charged with coordinating the electricity use and and the, the overall grid management for a single state. And then the other, the other type of entity and the type that Ohio is involved with are regional transmission organizations, otherwise known as RTOs, which can work, coordinate the electricity <clears throat> grid operations of numerous electric utilities and other service operators across a multi-state area. So that's Ohio was involved with an RTO, which can, which coordinates the purchase, the sale, and the flow of electricity throughout a multi-state region. And the the RTO that governs Ohio is <clears throat> you'll see it in the middle of the slide here. It's it's PJM interconnection, and PJM. It covers 13 states. It's Ohio, 
all of the states around Ohio, then many of the states on the East Coast, such as New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Virginia, West Virginia, along with the District of Columbia. And on this, uh, we have, it's, it was kind of surprising to me how many electric generators and transmission companies that don't have operations within Ohio are selling electricity into Ohio and even even Canadian power companies, turns out, are selling power into Ohio for use in Ohio. And here, we've had we've had a number of final determinations regarding the, the sightseeing of electric sales. And what we found is, if you go back to the earlier slide, that for Revised Code Section 57. 33.059D, the old Ohio corporate franchise tax section that governs the sizing of electricity in Ohio, that there's many outside of Ohio transmission companies and electric generation companies that meet code section or bullets three and four of 5733.059D, and that those those uh, sales are sightest to our, like are sightest to Ohio under 5739.059 D. So we're going to stick with electricity for just a few moments longer. Um, the way we've come out in these cases is that uh, we're going to sightest these sales based on purchaser's receipt, as the general rule provides. Um, and as 5733 um, sort of gets to, but doesn't uh, expressly say. Um, and we're looking at the buyer in each and every sale. So something that we've heard frequently is that once electricity is sort of loaded onto the grid, it's dispersed everywhere. There's no way to track any one seller's electricity and, and differentiate it from anyone else's. Um, so it's sort of everywhere on the grid at once. Um, which creates a, a difficulty in comparing it to tangible personal property. Um, well, the approach that we've taken is that we will look at the specific sale um, that is being sightest, and we will look at where that sale is quote unquote received by the purchaser. Many times it is um, the, just the location designated in the contract for delivery. Um, Again, it's really hard once the electricity is loaded onto the grid. It's really hard to tell where exactly it goes. Um, so that's usually our approach in these cases, um, and that's a that's a helpful tip for those of you out here who are looking to cite us these kinds of, of receipts. Now we're going to switch gears again. We're going to move on to agency. This is a very popular topic. Um, Here's the general definition. It's a person authorized by another person to act on its behalf to undertake a transaction for the other. And then we have a list of examples of, of common agent situations. Um, I'd like to point out a couple parts of that definition. Um, the first one is that the person must be authorized to act on another's behalf. So that's very important. They have the 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 purported principal has to know that the agent is acting on their behalf and then they have to be acting on their half on their behalf to undertake a transaction for the principal so it can't be on the purported agent's own account they can't be doing this for their own benefit it's to undertake a transaction for the principal so in these examples we have a person selling uh, a person receiving a fee for selling financial instruments. So this would be a, a financial advisor, stockbroker, or something along those lines. Um, a person retaining only a commission from a transaction with the other proceeds from the transaction being remitted to another person. In my experience, this is the one that comes up the most. This is where most taxpayers who are in a gray area wind up being. And then the last three there, number three, four, and five, those relate to state-appointed agents for purposes of selling hunting and fishing licenses. 
um, lotteries, sales, and then uh, liquor control agents. So those are very specific. If you are one of those types of agents, you already know it and you don't need to worry about it. Really, we're focusing on one and two with a lot of our um, cases and controversies that arise, and really mainly number two. Up. Right. Another thing we look at, we're, we're still on the subject of the agency exclusion for CAT. And every final determination I've been involved in, we always look at the three-factor test that's in the Ohio Administrative Code. It's 5703-29-13, paren C, paren, paren 2, paren, paren C, paren. So that, that is where our three-factor test is located. And so we're always looking at these three factors and trying to determine which of the factors the taxpayer meets. And the first factor is whether the taxpayer is required to work in the best interest of the owner. And that we're, that's often, we're, we're reading the, uh, the contracts that are submitted we're looking for that type of language in the contracts. We're uh, and moving on to the second factor. It's an agreement in writing stating that the general contractor is an agent of the owner. And the agency issues that I've been involved with, we haven't seen those. And I, I think general, a lot of times those where that's in writing that the uh, that there is an agent and there is a principal, that those don't tend to, to be assessed. So we, so we don't even end up seeing those in tax appeals division. A lot of those, those cases. And then the third, the third factor, is whether the purported agent is a conduit for payments for the principal. And that, yeah, sometimes. Yeah, that one, I've seen that one been met when we, maybe the other two aren't met as often. But it's always, it's, each case is independent and it stands, it stands on its own facts. So we, it's, it's quite a bit of digging into the contract and looking at these three factors. And this three factor test, it's a common it's a codification of common law agency decisions. So these are these are the we feel these are the appropriate factors to be looking at because they were the department obtained them from all the common law decisions that had been issued prior to the uh, prior to when this uh, this administrative code section went into force. Thanks, Bob. And continuing with the administrative code section, um, as Bob mentioned, it's largely based on what already existed in common law. Um, so I've got a portion of it up here for you to look at. Um, and it sort of describes the department's um, point of view when we're reviewing these. Um, we are required under that common law and under precedent to strictly construe claims against um, taxation. So exemptions from taxation are strictly construed in favor of the tax department. Um, we look at it very narrow and if there's any sort of question or doubt there's a good chance at least within the administrative levels of appeal that we're going to disallow the agency um, and force you to prove that, that it exists uh, at a court. Um, I'd also like to jump in and just give a little anecdote about when I was in law school and I was taking contracts class and drafting classes for contracts and torts uh, for negligence and liability and they really kind of hit home the idea that you never want to create an agency. It's really important not to accidentally write a contract that creates an agency because you can open your client up to liability. Um, it can, it can have very disastrous results if that's not the intention. And so it was really beat into our heads as law students not to do that. When I started this job, I found it kind of humorous that all of a sudden every taxpayer 
uh, wanted to be an agent. And it's because they want to take advantage of this exclusion, and I understand it. But from our perspective, um, it's really only available to people who actually are agents. And then just sort of an observational aside, um, when people intend to create an agent relationship, it's really obvious. It's written on the contract, and everything in the contract points to the two parties intending to be bound in that way. A lot of our issues arise where that's not clearly the intention. So from that perspective, most of the things we review really maybe not be, they might not be common law agents. Um, so it, it puts us in a difficult position and not wanting to look like the big, big bad tax department, but in my experience, agency contracts look completely different than other types of contracts. Um, so just, a, just something to think of when you're dealing with client issues. Um, is, is the agency stated on the face of the contract or are you really having to dig to come up with ways that your client is acting as an agent? And if so, we'll probably disagree. Okay, um, next slide. We're still on the subject of agency and we're we're in that same Ohio Administrative Code section, 5703-29-13. And this, the statute, the code section, the OAC code section provides, it gives us more guidance on agency. And one of the things that it provides is that the agency relationship shall be explicitly stated in a contract that is available for the tax commissioner to inspect. And as, as Ben was just saying, it seems like oftentimes the drafters of these contracts, they, for all other purposes other than Ohio CAT purposes, they don't want to be have an agency relationship and they, they don't write it into the agreement. So we're, we're often looking at agreements where it's, it's not explicitly stated in the agreement then further down in the rule, it provides that abs absent such proof of an explicit agency relationship, it's presumed that no agency relationship exists. And, and this is saying that the, the burden of proof is on the taxpayer to prove that an agency relationship exists if we don't have this agency language in the contract. Moving on to the next slide. We've got a, we've had a couple of decisions involving the agency issue. And the first one is Willoughby Hills Development and Distribution Inc. case. This was a Board of Tax Appeals decision issued in July 2016, and Willoughby Hills is a gasoline distributor of fuel products. It buys its fuel products from Sunoco and resells them to various service stations throughout northern Ohio. And in this case, Willoughby was claiming it was an agent for purported principal Sunoco. And the tax commissioner ruled in, in his final determination that there was no agency relationship. Taxpayer Willoughby Hills appealed it to the Board of Tax Appeals, and the Board of Tax Appeals agreed and affirmed the tax commissioner's final determination and wrote, the board wrote that while the, the contract did generically require the taxpayer to act in the purported principal's best interest in some respects, but the board concluded that that was insufficient evidence that the purported principal exercised control over taxpayer Willoughby Hills as its agent. And the written contract in this case stated that the parties, that it was an independent contractor relationship and it disclaimed 
there was a disclaimer of any agency relationship. And the board wrote, in the, in the board's opinion, that it would seem appropriate in this situation that not only there should be a witness from the agent's perspective, but also the principal's perspective should have been offered to support the negation of the contract language since the contract language was so clear in going against there being an agency relationship between these two parties. And the board had also noted that the taxpayer did not submit anything to the board to refute the contract language that disclaimed any any agency uh, relationship. Thank you, Bob. Uh, we're going to move on to the next case. Um, this one was Community Management Corporation. I might refer to them as CMC. Um, and this involved a large number of entities. Um, I will say that it, it went to the BTA, but ultimately the decision did not rest on the issue of agency. Um, that was sort of abandoned or settled prior to the final decision coming out. Um, it wasn't argued at the hearing at the BTA, but there was discussion about agency in the FD and in the notice of appeal to the BTA. Um, so generally there was a management company that managed various real estate holdings and each parcel of property had its own LLC. It was kind of just a holding company, it wasn't really an operating LLC, um, but each LLC did not have common ownership with the management company, so they were for cap purposes considered separate entities and not filing on a, on a group return. Um, the management company, there were several uh, related management companies, and they did have common ownership up until the, the highest tier entity. Um, and there were agreements between each LLC and the management companies on maintaining the properties. So if you could imagine a, um, an apartment complex or a commercial property where there's an on-site property manager that's hired by the real estate company to be there to address issues of the tenants. Um, that was the case here. So there was an agreement that created an agency and interestingly enough in this case the department didn't really dispute whether an agency relationship existed. It was um, more or less clear from the agreement. What was in dispute is that the employees that were working at the LLCs in the agreement were considered the employees of the management company. The management company provided their managers, their supervision, their tools. Um, it did their payroll. It provided their paid time off and leave. So the management company was really controlling all of the actions of these employees, although they did work at the locations owned by the LLCs. And what the department determined was that CMC was not due a refund because they had originally included reimbursements that the LLCs paid to the management company for those employees. And the question became whether or not the employees were employees of the management company or the LLCs, because if they were employees of the LLCs, then that reimbursement would be considered part of the agency relationship. But if the management company was being reimbursed for its own expenses, for its own costs of doing business, then those reimbursements would be considered taxable gross receipts. Um, the department's view is that any sort of reimbursements for costs or expenses of the agent should be included in the agent's commission or fee. So even if your contract has a stated fee, let's say 5% of a transaction, but you are then also reimbursed for other expenses, you need to consider that part of your uh, fee. All right. Well, we're moving on to a new topic here. This is, we've had a couple recent decisions here in 2018, and it's, uh, it's from the, uh, the origin of the CAT. It's the CAT net operating loss credit. And this is anybody involved in accounting 
is going to enjoy this issue because of the uh, the accounting uh, the accounting issues involved in this case. So this where this arose from, as I referred to earlier, to Ohio's it's the now repealed corporation franchise tax, which is in effect was Ohio's corporate income tax, which uh, has been phased out. Like I said earlier, 2009 or 2010 was was the last year. I think it might have been 2010, the last year of Ohio's corporate franchise tax. But many taxpayers had on their books, they had a deferred tax asset. Companies that had racked up large net losses had a deferred tax credit asset on their books for these net operating losses, and that these this deferred tax asset, net operating loss carry forwards, could be used in future years to offset future income they would earn on uh, on their corporate franchise tax liability. So they could use these deferred tax assets to reduce corporate franchise taxes owed in the future when they had net income future years. So the taxpayers were faced when Ohio's corporate franchise tax, the corporate income tax, was phased out, these taxpayers no longer had a place to use these deferred tax assets that were on their books. And the companies were faced with having to write off these deferred tax assets in total, just write them off to expense all at once. So there, there was legislation passed to help these companies. And what the legislation did was it allowed, it put in place a methodology where taxpayers could transfer, in effect, their deferred tax assets from the corporate franchise tax and use that as against the CAT. It was the CAT net operating loss credit where the taxpayer would get the, the benefit of those deferred tax assets on their books and corporate franchise tax where they wouldn't have to write them off and they'd be used against the commercial activity tax amounts that they owed going forward. And first case here on the slide, you'll see we're talking about, oh, you can go back to the slide here. This is Navistar V11 and this was, this is an old, case and the, the CAD NOL credit probably doesn't have much use for practitioners now since this is this is an old issue from the very beginnings of the CAD back in most of the appeals on this. The, the appeals have all been submitted and we're just getting finally getting some of the uh, some of the, the case of uh, the court uh, Supreme Court decisions. So we're, we're really at the tail end of this decision for corporate, uh, for commercial activity tax purposes. But anyway, on Navistar, Navistar took the, uh, they had, they were a company that had deferred tax assets on their books for, for the corporate franchise tax. And they, they transitioned it over to the CAT NOL credit and there was, a, there was a dispute with the department on the computation of the credit. Navistar computed their valuation allowance based upon their original income statements. However, Navistar later had to restate its books when it was found that its books were not in compliance with generally accepted accounting principles. So then, at that point, the Department of Taxation's tax examiners restated the valuation allowance based on the, uh, the restated books, which, which resulted in there being uh, a 100% valuation allowance. And the valuation allowance is what reduces the amount of the amortizable amount, which is the amount of the credit the CAT NOL credit that the, that the taxpayer is allowed to take over a period of years. So in this case, 
the Department of Taxation, based on the restated books, took a 100% a valuation allowance. It totally eliminated Navistar's CAT and LL credit. And going on to the next slide, the board held that upon remand from the Ohio Supreme Court, the BTA upheld the Department of Taxation's reduction of the CAT and LL credit to zero. And the, the Supreme Court holding was that the board properly determined that the company's original valuation allowance was not in compliance with GAAP and due to the books being restated, the department was proper in raising the valuation allowance to 100%, which entirely eliminated the CAT and OL credit in this situation. Thanks, Bob. And we've got another NOL credit case from the Supreme Court that was decided. Um, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this because, as Bob mentioned, these are kind of old issues that are just being resolved and, and it's not going to come up in the future. Um, but in this case, uh, Dana Corp uh, applied for an NOL credit, which they received, and then subsequently went through a bankruptcy and a bankruptcy reorganization. Um, the department made a couple reductions to the NOL credit that was submitted um, based on other factors. And then when the bankruptcy was completed, the department believed that the realization of cancellation of debt income eliminated the NOLs for the, for the entity that emerged from the bankruptcy. Um, so we, we reduced the credit further based on that realization of uh, cancellation of debt income. So the question for the Supreme Court was whether a specific section of the statute um, that details how the NOL credit should be computed, that's 5751.53F, whether the adjustment that the department made due to the bankruptcy was allowable. And that section, it's up here on your screen, it reads that if an entity transfers all or a portion of its assets and equity to another entity as part of an organization or reorganization that has no gain or loss recognized for federal income tax purposes, then the tax attributes of the former company are transferred to the uh, surviving company. The department felt that because the former company essentially went away, it dissolved, um, that its tax attributes were extinguished at that point and the new company could no longer claim the NOLs of the former company. But based on this uh, code section, the Supreme Court disagreed and said, no, they, they get to maintain the uh, tax attributes of the former entity. So in the end, the Supreme Court allowed the department's first adjustment to the credit, which was not based on the bankruptcy issue at all, but disallowed the subsequent adjustments and reductions that the department was seeking um, because they felt that the new entity that emerged from the bankruptcy could utilize the bankrupt entity's uh, former tax attributes. All right, next we're, we're moving on to a, uh, another uh, topic. And this is, this was, to me, this is like one of the fun things about being a lawyer when you're waiting on it. People were waiting on, this is South Dakota versus Wayfair. It was at the U.S. Supreme Court, and people were saying, well, it's a very, it was a very important decision for a lot of different taxes, for, and it affects every state in the United States, I would think. And when it came out, there was a lot of buzz at work, and everybody was going to the Internet to see what, what the U.S. Supreme Court had decided, and it's it's a very important nexus decision. And for so prior to this decision, prior to South Dakota v. Wayfair, the old standard we had the U.S. Supreme Court cases of Quill and National Bellis Hess. In those cases, the U.S. Supreme Court had said that there was a physical presence required in order in order for there to be nexus present for a state to tax uh, a taxpayer. And Wayfair 
turns this upside down. The court, the U.S. Supreme Court now has completely, maybe, maybe I shouldn't say completely, we'll, uh, we'll say, well, the Supreme Court has definitely, it's overruled Quill and National Bellis Hess and made that those cases with regard to nexus, they can't be followed anymore. And the, the new standard now is that if, that if a taxpayer meets the nexus standards of a state, then no physical presence is required between the taxpayer and that state for there to be nexus and taxation. In this case, so Wayfair, it's a very large internet retailer. They sell home goods, furnishings, home accessories, home furnishings and decor. The company is based in Massachusetts, so it has five broad retail websites where they sell 10 million products with 10,000 suppliers and it's based in Boston. And it seemed to me it's somewhat like, I, I was calling it the Amazon of the home furniture and home furnishings world. And it's, you know, their platform is just about as big and they sell, you know, throughout the United States, similar to Amazon. And in this case, the state of South Dakota had, has a nexus law that if a taxpayer has 200 transactions with, Nef with South Dakota in the year or $100,000 of sales of goods in the South Dakota in a year, that that is their that is their nexus statute. And if you meet either one of those 200 transactions or $100,000 of goods in the South Dakota in a year, then nexus was held. And in this case, the, uh, the US Supreme Court found that, that Wayfair did have, it did have the 200 transactions and the $100,000 of sales in the South Dakota. So, South Dakota's assessing of sales tax was upheld and, and the court held that, uh, that South Dakota, that Wayfair was required to collect and remit sales tax to the state of South Dakota. And the U.S. Supreme Court noted that this decision it's due to the changing of the U.S. economy, due to the, the rise of e-commerce, the internet revolution, and the change in our national economy due to uh, internet sales. Okay, and I'm actually, we're running out of time here, so we talk about why the Wayfair decision is relevant, but for cap purposes, we've been using a factor presence test all along, so we're gonna continue to do that. Uh, we've had our own nexus decisions in the Ohio Supreme Court. Um, they're listed here. It's Crutchfield, V. Testa, Mason, Newegg. Um, and we're going to skip over that. Okay. Um, all right. We're ready for the second code word. <clears throat> we'll pause just for a minute. We're run we've only got a couple minutes left in our presentation. But the code word here is nexus. Again, the code word is nexus. Then on to the next slide. Okay. And as we predicted, we've run out of time. Um, so we are going to put up our information here. Um, if any of you look through the slides for the appeals and the audit process and you have any questions, please enter them into the, the chat function of the webinar. Um, but if you think of something after the fact, We'll get to this last slide. I apologize. There we go. If you think of something after the webinar is closed, please feel free to email either Bob or I and uh, let us know what your question is and we'll try to respond to you as soon as we can. And at this time, we're going to conclude our presentation and send it back to Leah. Thank you. At this time, we're going to go to break. All audio and visual will be suspended while we are at break. However, we ask that you do log, stay logged on.
We will return from break at 9.